said to the guy, why would I worry about that? It's just the mongoose. Hey, history peeps, hope you're having a great day. Uh, today, the lecture is going to be a little bit different because we're going to be talking about something that's pretty important in history and doesn't always get a lot of play. So, what am I talking about? Basically, we're going to talk about some groups that maybe in some histories aren't as talked about as they need to be. So if you read a lot of history books from way back when and some still now, you would think that everyone running around who is important or is doing anything is a white man. And that's because people tend to write, historians even tend to write kind of towards their identity. And a lot of places in society, men are the ones in charge, specifically the white men, so they are the ones making big decisions. But it turns out, if you're studying history, there's a lot more to what you need to know than just about the people making big decisions. You do need to know that, but you don't want to fall into the trap of what we might call great man history, which is, you know, you have this, all this stuff is going on, but you have one person who's really just there to save the day. And those people might be great. Abraham Lincoln is, uh, often you'll read biographies of Abraham Lincoln. It sounds like this, but you got to remember, he did not march down south and fight himself. So he, there were a lot of people necessary to bring his wishes to fruition. So that's kind of what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about African Americans in the Civil War and women. So let's hop right into it. African Americans at the beginning of the war are present on both sides. Obviously, there's 4 million enslaved folks in the South and some free African Americans as well. There's many, many free communities of African Americans in the North. A lot of those free communities in the North do want to form military units and go fight to preserve the Union and end slavery in the South. People know that this war is about slavery. Um, your soldiers on both sides might not necessarily frame it that way. But it's pretty clear that that's a big difference, and the people in charge do know that. Frederick Douglass, who I know you've studied already, was super into this idea of outfitting uh, black regiments. They would use the term colored regiments or colored units. So if I say that, that's because that's the term they would use and the name that they would use and sending them south to fight. He was really into that whole idea of African Americans having a stake in this war. But at the beginning of the war, in 1861 and most of 1862, African Americans were only used as labor by both armies. The North would obviously pay the African Americans for their labor, whereas the South uh, would use slaves. If you were a Southern officer or planter person who had a slave, you might bring a servant with you. Or if you were a plantation owner or someone with slaves where the Confederate Army was operating and they needed labor, they might come to you and say, hey, we need to use your slaves for X, Y, and Z. Um, so they are present. Uh, many of these units of African Americans or many African Americans in the North especially want to fight, but they are not allowed to until 1862, 1863. And that's just uh, because so many people were dying and being wounded that the government is looking for more soldiers, and here's obviously these people want to fight and haven't been allowed to. Haven't really, this group hasn't really been tapped yet. But everything wasn't perfect if you're an African American soldier, and I know it's weird to think like wanting to fight so bad, wanting to put yourself in danger so bad, but it was a part of equality at that time, right? Because the reason they weren't being allowed to fight was racism. Um, basically th saying they couldn't possibly be as good as white soldiers. So some battles will happen where the black soldiers have to prove that. And by the end of the war, they're more integrated into the full hierarchy of the Northern armies. Um, and it ends up that 180,000 uh, African-Americans serve in the Northern armies. That's about 10% of people who served in the army. But there's some caveats here. A lot of times they might not get as nice of equipment. They might be sent on missions that were inherently more dangerous or had a lower chance of success, or maybe they'd be the first ones in um, to a place that was really dangerous so that they could like maybe save some white lives. And they got paid less. They got paid less money. A uh, white soldier would be paid about $13 a month, and a black soldier could expect maybe like $11 a month. So that's just straight up discrimination and racism. And so it wasn't all great if you were a soldier uh, from the U.S. Army who was black. Um, in the Navy, things were a little more equal, it turns out. I did uh, learn that just in my research, and you would get paid the same and treated basically the same in most things, except it was very, very difficult or maybe even impossible to get a leadership role uh, for an African-American in the Navy. But besides for that, 
It was better than being in the army. At least that's what it sounded like to me. Uh, one other added danger of being an African American in the Northern armies, if you were captured, a lot of times you wouldn't be captured, you would be massacred. And there's lots of instances of this of Southern soldiers uh, would treat the, uh, what's the word, the United States black soldiers basically as runaway slaves, returning them to uh, slavery or just killing them on the spot. Um, one cool uh, history kind of moment in detail, if you want to look it up, you can. The Indiana 28th Colored Infantry Regiment, 28th Infantry Regiment from Indiana or Indiana 28th, uh, was raised in Indianapolis and around this whole area and basically fought in some huge battles in the Civil War. And that's just like a little bit of interesting, uh, interesting tidbit for you. In the South, they just kept their slaves enslaved. They really never uh, used them as soldiers. There are very few kind of small, tiny exceptions to that. But they never really saw combat. They were just too afraid to ever arm their slaves for obvious reasons, right? That's their biggest fear is a slave rebellion. So in their minds, why would they do that? All right, next we're going to talk about women during the Civil War. And they are going to have a lot of changes at this time, a lot of things kind of going on. Um, women served as spies, women served as nurses, some women served as soldiers, which we'll talk about in a second. And even for those women who stayed at home, things are going to change. So basically, this war is big on spies. you got to remember, we had been one country. People know people on both sides. They have connections across these boundaries, so it's pretty easy for information to actually travel as long as there's not like an army right there who, that doesn't want this information out a lot of times it can travel the two capitals of the two countries although if you ask me the south never country i'm going to stop that before mr robinson gets on my case um but the two capitals for the two countries are only 100 miles apart so if you have uh, spies in their capital they can get information to you very quickly and washington dc had a ton of people who are actually super sympathetic to the south and would uh, gain information about the northern army movements and send it south and there was even a woman who was a slave of jefferson davis the confederate president who was writing uh secrets down the entire war and sending them north so lots of well-documented examples of female spies during the war uh nurses nurses were a big part of the war because many of these weapons that they were using and i won't get into it because i'll never stop talking i know you hate that uh, but many of these weapons they were using caused terrible, terrible injuries. You would probably end up dying or maimed, but even if you did end up dying, it might not be instant. Um, and so there were huge field hospitals set up, basically, and most of the men were doing the fighting, and then there were doctors, would-be men, but there were many, many, many female nurses uh, who participated in this war, either near the front lines or a little farther back. And they saw some horrible, terrible, terrible things. And they really kind of, that was like the main way, if you're a patriotic woman on either side, if you wanted to really help, you probably became a nurse. Um, and this is one of the first wars, or definitely one of the first American wars, where you have these big field hospitals. So they needed people to staff them. And women are a resource people who can do that. All right, soldiers, this is interesting. This is a pretty small thing, really. It's just estimated there were like a few hundred women who did this, but it's pretty cool. Um, basically, there were women who dressed as men and fought as soldiers. They were patriotic and they wanted to fight. They wanted to help that way, both sides. Um, and a lot of them joined up for the same reasons. Like I just said, as a man might, they were patriotic or they wanted to seek adventure or they felt that women had a very strict role in society and they didn't like that. So they felt that maybe if they went off, they might escape some of those circumstances. So regardless of the cause, you got a few hundred. Um, I saw the number 400, but it's hard to tell. And I'll tell you how we know even these numbers in a minute. Because it was actually really easy to hide <laughs> that you were your gender at the time, it turns out. Everyone was wearing baggy clothes. It was like the fashion of the time and everyone was all about modesty, men and women. So. Even in these army camps, everyone is bathing separately, using the restrooms separately, and even sleeping in full clothes. Like, that wasn't a weird thing to do. So long story short, you could actually just kind of get away with cutting your hair short and saying your 
name was not Wilma, but it was Will, and there you go. Most of the women who did get discovered, it was either because they got wounded or sick, so they had to go to the hospital, or actually, this is like the real crazy part, it's because they would write letters home. And so years and years later, historians would discover these letters, and we know that there was a woman in this unit. So I saw one where they didn't discover the letters until like 1976. So for over 100 years, no one knew that this woman had served in the unit, which is pretty crazy. The other big change was on the home front. Home front in a war is the part of the like country that's not <laughs> the army, basically, and it has to support that army. So the Civil War was one of the first times in American history where the whole country was involved in just trying to keep these armies afloat and trying to subdue the other side. These women might not be spies or nurses or soldiers, but they're still a big part of it because the people who had been doing these jobs were men and now the men are gone. So most Northerners are gonna be farmers. The main man of the house a lot of times has gone fighting or his son or whatever. So women have to pick up the slack on the farm. So many women, if you rode through a field that in 1858 was full of men, it's now full of women. And this is proving that they can do work the same as men. A lot of people, it's weird to think, but a lot of people said women were incapable of doing that. Well, here they're doing it. Factories, same thing. A lot of the men go and fight. Now the women get more jobs in factories. There had been some women in factories before. You could pay them less than men. Uh, but now there's even more women in factories producing all the goods to make this war effort work. Okay, In the South, there's no factories, but women get together and they start sewing as much as they can, day and night, uh, to supply the units from their, from their town or their community or whatever it is. And they create other kind of items of war as they can as well. Okay, so that's kind of my lecture. I went a little long here. I know I say that every time, and that's because I like to talk, apparently. Uh, but basically, just always remember when you're studying history, it's not all about the stuffy old white dude making a big decision and everybody claps for him. Uh, you do need to know about those guys as well, but there's a lot more going on. So hopefully this helped enlighten you a little bit, and see you next time.